welcome everyone. This is um, a National Voices webinar. We do this at the moment on a fortnightly basis and we're almost nearing the end of our series. So towards the end of this webinar, I'll ask you all whether you've got any thoughts on what we should talk about next after the summer break in August. So you could ponder that on the back of your mind whilst we talk about the unequal impacts of um, mental health during lockdown. Um, most of our webinars have had a sort of inequalities focus, and that's because we think um, that's certainly one of the stories that needs telling during this period. And also because we are in our minds getting ready to organise a very ambitious conference in the autumn that looks at Marmot 10 years on, um, what have we learned? That was launched just before lockdown. I remember going to the event and it felt a bit incongruous having a massive event. Um, so it looks at Marmot and it looks at COVID and tries to understand what this means for our sector. And so we think these webinars have helped us understand what's going on, what people are thinking, what people are doing in our sector about inequalities. And this clearly is a very important topic. So we're really pleased we've got Andy Bell with us today. Andy is um, one of the directors at the Centre for Mental Health. And the Centre for Mental Health have just joined National Voices, which is wonderful. Um, and they do brilliant research and influencing um, around all sorts of mental health policy aspects and practice aspects, but always have a very keen eye on inequalities. Um, so he's going to talk to us about a very recent report they have done um, that unpacks all the different inequality dimensions around um, mental health and COVID. Um, before we get cracking with that, um, we'd like to um, just remind you of a very few technical bits and pieces. We are recording this. I'm handing over to Sam now, who's going to very briefly walk you through. We kind of think most of you have by now done some webinars, but we don't want to uh, make that assumption um, wrongly. So Sam is just going to briefly talk you through technology. Good morning all. I'm Sam on the comms office at National Voices. Um, I'll keep this really, really brief and uh, pain free. Um, so you've got seven icons at the bottom of your screen at the moment, as you can see. Uh, one to control your video, uh, your microphone. Um, if you could keep this on mute whilst the speakers are speaking, that'd be great. This is just to reduce feedback. Um, and then you've then got a uh, speech icon, which is launched your chat uh, chat box. If you could launch this right now, that'd be great. And introduce yourself just so you can get used to it. Um, later on in the, uh, in, as you said, it's seen in the webinar, we're going to be having a discussion. So if you'd like to speak, if you could raise your hand, that'd be great or we'll, we'll allow you some time just to sort of verbally contribute later. Um, most of the contributions today, if you've been on National Voices webinar before, you'll know, are in the chat. So if you've got any questions or insights, please put them there. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, Charlotte. And um, if you do need them, live captioning is available on this. If you go to more options, which is the three dots in the centre, you can then turn on live captioning and that will be presented in the bottom left of your screen. Um, uh, Yes, if you're experiencing any tech difficulties during this, please drop me a message on Teams or you can drop me an email at sam.batey at nationalvoice.org.uk. Um, yeah, as I said, please keep sharing insights throughout on the chat and we'll try and get to you as many uh, to as many of you as possible um, in the general discussion. Back to you, Charlotte. Brilliant, thank you. So the agenda for today, um, I'm going to give a very brief update um, on stuff uh, we have done recently and um, then we're going to hand over to Andy then we're going to have you know a decent chunk of time to discuss um, what we've heard and what how it resonates with with your work and what thoughts the triggers in your mind what questions you have and then we've got Kate here Kate give a wave yeah <laughs> Kate is a project manager who's delivering a project for us in collaboration with the Centre for Mental Health that looks at better integrating physical and mental health services and we're currently in the research phase and she can update us on what we're doing and why we're doing it and then I conclude with some you know a bit of future focus and housekeeping um so very briefly then about um what's happened what we've always what we're always doing at the beginning of these um webinars is look back briefly at previous webinars because where we have people from NHS England or the Department of Health or other government agencies joining us we always say to them can you feed back to us what you're doing differently as a consequence of what you've heard at these webinars because so many of you contribute very freely 
your experiences and your thoughts. And it's um, always a really good idea to then ask our NHS England Let's Take colleagues to say, OK, what have you heard? What have you learned? And are you going to raise this with anyone or are you going to do anything? Um, so I'm going to very briefly review the, the webinar we did on lifting the lockdown um, and, and the shielding where there's been a lot of activity and then the one on the digital divide. So the digital divide one was um, the one we did two weeks ago and we had two colleagues from uh, NHS X uh, listening in. And despite chasing it a couple of times, uh, they have not got back to us with anything they've done as a consequence of our uh, conversation together. So we will keep chasing that. I'm sure they're busy people, but I think it's also important to sort of close the loop in that way. But we've not stopped um, thinking about the digital divide clearly, and um, it's, it features very strongly in our influencing work around new models of primary care. And um, we're going to launch um, research in late July that looks at people's experiences of remote models of care. Um, really interesting. The webinar is on the, can't remember what, but it's on our uh, website. I think the 23rd of July, I want to say. Um, so, and then the one before that was about lifting the lockdown um, and, and how it affects shielded and other vulnerable populations. And um, we've been very busy around the shielding programme and there have obviously been further announcements. Um, the furlough scheme and the shielding programme are planned to come to an end at the end of July. We have some serious concerns around some of the sort of protection mechanisms for people. We don't want to be, as an organisation and also as a sector, saying to people, don't go out, it's not safe. Um, a, we don't know, we haven't got the data, all the data capabilities to say how safe it is or not for people to go out. But also we think staying in indefinitely is really not good for people either and staying isolated. Um, but we think that there need to be some safeguards in place for people to have genuine choice and to be able to make good decisions about the level of risk they're comfortable with. And particularly, that's obviously the case when it's about employment. So we are um, working quite hard with a number of other charities and figuring out how we could influence during these next four weeks, because we believe that there are some jobs that cannot be made safe very easily. So if you work hands on with people, let's say, or if you work on a job where you're very exposed to a whole load of people all the time, it might just not be possible to make that job safe. And we think people need to be allowed to stay furloughed um, if they're on the shielding list and vulnerable and cannot safely return to work. So we are building a bit of a campaign around that. If you want to find out more about this, again, do get in touch. Um, and we're also kind of working with government around other aspects of the shielding, the end of the shielding program. Um, and to that end, we've convened a group of people who are shielding or vulnerable, and we're asking them what is a priority for them. And uh, so we're asking things about uh, the idea of a shooting hour or should there be special times when people go shopping or some people have floated the idea of this badge or a lanyard that you can wear to show that you'd quite like people to stay distant from you. Um, but really what we're hearing very, very clearly from talking to the shielded is that um, they feel quite ignored and they feel very forgotten about and they feel that they need a conversation with someone in the NHS about what next. Um, that was originally in the guidance. I don't know whether any of you ever bothered reading all of that, but when the shooting program was established, there was a commitment that everybody on this program would be contacted by a named clinician and would have a conversation. And we don't have a sense that that ever happened. And we do think this is, as you end the shooting program, it's really important that that conversation takes place. Um, you know, people got a letter from the government on government, you know, head, headed paper saying you are clinically extremely vulnerable. And we think we can't just sort of now say to people, oh, sorry, it's over. We have to actually reach out to them and have a conversation about risk and how people are. And from our COVID Voices, which is this platform that we've created where everybody can contribute their experiences, we also know that some people have found it really, really hard and that people have experienced you know, a lack of support. A lot of people have been cut off from loads of services they used to be in contact with. And we feel it's important to check in with people now and make sure that they are coping. And I know that coping is one of the things um, Andy's going to talk about, because that's, I think, quite an important concept in, in mental health. Um, so that takes me to the next step of this webinar. Um, 
And Andy, I think I need to say to you, you can now take control of the slides or some such coded message. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, a huge thank you to you and National Voices for, for the extraordinary uh, advocacy and creating a platform for the voices of people who are shielding and who are um, in inverted commas vulnerable at this time. It's outstanding work that you've been doing over this period and, and we we delighted to be working alongside you on our joint project on, on physical and mental health and, and the overlaps between them. Uh, and, and it's great to have that that connection between our two organisations. It's, it's really brilliant. And thank you for giving this event over today to talk about inequalities in mental health during, during COVID-19. Um, what I thought I'd do is just share some of the results from, from, from our recent uh, uh, briefing paper that looked at mental health inequalities at this time, um, but also share some of the other insights we've been coming up with and uh, I shall try and do that nice and quickly so that there's lots of time for conversation later. Um, so, and, and thank you for, for introducing Centre for Mental Health or an independent organisation and, and our interest really is in how we can use evidence to, to, to really reduce inequalities in mental health and give everyone a better chance of having good mental health throughout their lives. Um, so, so one of the trite phrases you hear used often is we all have mental health, but this is a really important concept to understand during uh, the current time, almost more than any other time, though it's relevant, of course, uh, 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 always, um, that, that mental health isn't just that thing. You either have a mental health problem or you don't. Uh, we all of us are somewhere on what we call this spectrum of, of, of mental health. Um, and hopefully most of the people on this webinar are, are in the, the green part of it today, but we won't all be. Uh, and, and for lots of people, um, uh, time is spent on every single one of these, these different uh, aspects of it. So what we know um, from prevalence surveys is about a quarter of us will have uh, a, a significant mental health difficulty at any one time. And over the course of our lives, around about three quarters of us will. Um, probably more than that, but, but that's roughly what, what the evidence would suggest from surveys. Uh, and crucially, this isn't some innate quality in us. We're not fixed in one point on this spectrum. We're all of us moving up and down it. And, and the things that influence our mental health are more or less about the environments we live in and the way we're living and, and our relationships with other people. So there are things called risk and protective factors uh, for our mental health, and, and that's what determines it. This is very much a socially, economically, maybe politically determined uh, state. It's not something that is a judgment on us uh, and, and uh, uh, our kind of strength or weakness or other ideas that used to um, pervade the way we thought about our mental health. So what do we know about, about the current crisis? Well, inevitably, I think we can all say with some certainty that this, this has been a collective trauma. Um, it's literally happening to all of us. Uh, every single person in globally, but certainly in, in the UK is affected by COVID-19. Uh, and for many, many people, it is a traumatic event. But I think we also know, and it's becoming more and more apparent, that we're not all experiencing it in the same ways. Uh, and, and this traumatic experience is, is particularly affecting uh, some people more than others. Um, and there are effects that are both direct from the virus itself, so we know that the people who have been treated for the virus, um, many of whom will, will have had very frightening experiences in hospital, will have a significant risk of, of trauma symptoms afterwards. And of course, there are many people who've sadly been affected by this through, through losing a loved one uh, and not being able to grieve in the normal way. So there are very direct traumatic effects from the virus that are affecting some people. Um, we also know that, that the lockdown itself can be a traumatic experience for some, particularly children and young people or indeed anyone who's in a household where they don't feel safe or where they experience abuse or neglect. Um, and we also know that there will be significant ongoing effects from whatever happens economically from here onwards. And I'll talk a bit more about that later and why that's important to mental health. Um, but essentially, the other thing we know is, is that we don't all start on a level playing field. Uh, and people who've had traumatic experiences prior to this will find the traumatic experiences going on now potentially worse for their mental health. Um, and anyone living in situations where they face systemic discrimination and exclusion, and, and we've had a lot of um, uh, interesting discussions around racism 
uh, of late uh, that's brought to the surface things that have been around for, for many communities for a very long time but they're all part of what influences our mental health uh, and so we need to understand that we're not all starting in the same place even if we're affected in the same ways now uh, what puts us at risk of mental health is often what's gone before uh, and and the kind of way we're living and and our rights and our position so, so this is a kind of very illustrative guide to, to what happens around mental health and COVID. Uh, and again, um, don't worry too much about the axes and the numbers, but what we're seeing is, is that uh, as, as the virus goes up suddenly and then gradually recedes, the levels of mental health need, they were already there anyway, but they have gone up. There's evidence from surveys that the level of, of psychological distress in the population has gone up and it's gone up very suddenly. And that follows in the wake of the virus, but it doesn't go down at the same time. Lots of people will, it's important to say, bounce back uh, from, from the things that they're experiencing now. But many, many people won't. And of course, what we don't know is how quickly that mental health curve will go down. But we know it's there and we know it's significant. And crucially, what we've seen, particularly from, from some of the survey evidence that's coming out, but also evidence from, from other parts of the world that had the virus sooner, um, is that the mental health risks, again, they're not equally distributed among the population. So we know that being in isolation uh, is particularly toxic to children and young people. They have less power over their lives, less able to, to perhaps uh, cope with, with, with being kind of uh, restricted to a certain place, more used to, to e even children and young people who use digital technology a lot. They still rely very much on face to face contact with peers. Uh, particularly if they're in a stressful home situation. And I think for children and young people, and particularly young adults, there's a real sense of, of economic exclusion and, and, and many are in the occupations which are disproportionately affected. Uh, think about hospitality and the number of young people who, who are, are in those industries uh, and are now facing a sense of, am I ever going to get into work? Is this ever gonna be okay for me? Will I be left behind permanently? National Voices, of course, has really advocated for people with long term conditions and, and we know that the psychological effects of this, it's worth remembering if you have a long term condition, you're already twice as likely to have poor mental health than the average for the population anyway. So again, you're starting at a higher point of risk uh, and this experience will be making that worse. We've talked about racism and, and again, the disproportionate effect on, on many communities of the virus. Interestingly, those same communities are the ones that have higher rates of poor mental health and, and diagnosed severe mental illness uh, and indeed being treated coercively by the state for their mental health. Uh, and, and one of the things we've noticed is, is there are significant risks to people with mental health difficulties. Um, one of the things we've noticed particularly is a real difficulty getting access to basic needs. We had to work very, very hard to get the NHS volunteer responder scheme, for example, to, to respond to the needs of people who couldn't get to shops because of their mental illness. Thankfully, that scheme is now available, uh, but, but at first it wasn't clear that was the case. Uh, and there are other groups of people, I shan't go into this exhaustively because we'll be here all day, but again, the risks are not unequal and there are significant groups of people whose mental health is, is under threat at this time. So let's think positively, what will help? What can we do about this? And I think crucially what we've seen and what we've put in our report is, is first of all, we need to think short term and, and long term at the same time. So for short term, as, as you've said, Charlotte, the financial safety nets that have been created at this time have actually done an enormous amount to help people's mental health as, as well as, as their incomes that may well have reduced uh, what could have been even worse mental health difficulties. Uh, in the population and we need to make sure that, that they are kept for as long as possible for the people who need them, particularly those in the most disadvantaged in marginalised communities. And we must make sure that, that people, particularly with poor mental health, do get the help they need uh, to keep food on the table, money coming in uh, and, and make sure that, that as the furlough scheme ends and, and, and some of the kind of protections for people from being evicted come to an end, that, that, that we don't see a very substantial group of people really suffering then. We need to make sure we go back to the big ambitious plans that were set out for improving mental health support in the NHS long term plan. Remember that? 
Um, and hopefully what we, we very much hope is that some of the emergency powers set out to, to reduce safeguards under the Mental Health Act never get used. That would be a great achievement if we never ever use those, those extra powers to, to treat people coercively. But we also need to ensure that community organisations that meet the needs of groups that, that don't find mainstream services helpful are, are funded. Many, many, many are now living on reserves uh, and, and in danger of disappearing. We cannot let the fact that these organisations have stepped up be what brings, brings the, their future to an end because they're not being supported. And crucially, the most important thing we can do is do everything we can to prevent further waves of the virus. You remember the chart I showed you earlier? I hope so. Um, here's what would happen differently if there's a single wave of the virus in terms of mental health compared to multiple waves. And what we see, particularly because of the economic effects and the disastrous economic effects uh, of a recession or a depression, is that if, if, if we have a single wave, then mental health needs will eventually settle down. If we have multiple waves, mental health needs will just go up and up and up. And we need to avoid that because that will be extremely distressing and extremely costly. So longer term, thinking about what we can do over a period of time, because again, there is a real sense now and lots of people are using the phrase build back better. Um, we need to get the message that as well as investing in the NHS, we must invest in local public health services. We must invest in social care. Um, often public health and social care are not seen as being about mental health. But actually local authorities up and down this country are taking steps, building plans to support the emotional well-being of their communities and particularly those who've been most affected. Social care has a hugely important role in mental health. It's not just about later life. It's not just about care homes, important as they are. So we must see investment in them next week when the Chancellor makes his next statement. It'd be a really good time to put substantial funding into public health to protect our mental health during this really vulnerable time to come. There's a real opportunity here to bring that understanding of trauma, of this trauma we've all been through, into mainstream services, into services for people with long term conditions, into schools, uh, into hospitals, into workplaces. Let's bring that understanding of trauma, creating safe spaces for all. I'll share a resource later which talks a bit more about that. Let's bring mental health into all policies and decisions. Would the government really have rode back on, on its decision to suspend sanctions during COVID if mental health had been a serious consideration in the way decisions get made? Uh, we know what damage welfare benefits sanctions do to people's mental health. So why on earth would we bring those back? We must take long term action to address race inequality and mental health. There were some important, really important recommendations in, in the Mental Health Act review that Sir Simon Wesley published in 2018. Uh, we need to get right back onto those and make sure we, we, we have long term sustained action to reduce those inequalities that we've seen. Uh, and, and again, we have seen some positive things happen as well as the suspension of sanctions. We saw some real immediate action to reduce homelessness and to tackle street homelessness in particular. Let's make sure we hold on to that and keep going. If you want to know more about trauma informed approaches, here's a quick thing which will hopefully be on the slide to go around to everyone that gives you some of the principles uh, of what a trauma informed approach looks like. It relates to a project that, that uh, we were lucky enough to do together with the Mental Health Foundation that focused specifically on women's uh, services across the piece, not just mental health services. Uh, so, so here should be some links to, uh, to that. Before that, just a, re a simple point that this is very much about having had a trauma and therefore we need to help society to heal. And crucially, this won't happen in health services. It will happen in communities. It will happen when people come together as people rebuild their relationships, plan for their future. People will need space to grieve and to come to terms with what's happened and will need to create opportunities for that. And crucially, the thing that I think has been missing is good, clear, consistent, empathic communication both from, from national government, where it's sometimes been chaotic and unclear, but also from local health services as well. You've got to really think about the way that the letters that come from GP surgeries, the messages people get from health professionals, there needs to be a sense of safety, of compassion, 
uh, of consistency and, and, and listening as well, making sure that they're receiving feedback and hearing what people are saying and responding to that. OK, I did forget that there was a slide in between. I apologise for that. But here are some links to some resources. I shan't linger on them now because they'll be in the slide pack that go out. But I hope they're useful and I hope that there's something in here uh, that people can pick up. Engage, engaging with complexity at the end is the one where you'll find the stuff on trauma informed uh, approaches and you can put them in place in any service anywhere, whatever you're doing. Please, please, please learn about trauma, learn about being trauma informed uh, and take this on board. And, and I hope that's been useful. Right. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, here are Andy's contact details for those of you who want to reach out to him directly. He's obviously also on um, Twitter. Um, sorry, I'm going back. I don't mean to do that. Um, we have time to discuss this now. Um, we thought we structure this a little bit um, so that we get a bit of a conversation going rather than just everybody saying random unconnected pieces. So the first question we would like um, to talk to you about is um, what you've heard, what of that resonates, if, is there anything else you're aware of, you know, that you think we should know? Um, I've seen on the chat, um, Kirit has been uh, engaging really actively and has been linking, um, sharing links, um, particularly I think to the sort of connection between mental ill health and racism and the inequality that feeds both. Kiri, do you want to say something? You know, what of Andy's talk has resonated with you? Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, Andy, it's, it's good to reinforce some of the, the, the strong messages and I think you know, some of you, some of us who were around when we had the Dealing Race Equality and Mental Health Program many moons ago, again, was a great opportunity, but a missed opportunity as well. So now we've got race back on the agenda. I think we need to actually do something positive and more. Um, we need we need to have a real clear action plan and taking that forward and, and not a piecemeal approach. But what I've what I've highlighted is is, is a couple of points. Um, I, I work for a, a BME mental health charity in Leicester called ADAR. Um, we've been around for 30 years. We're the only BAMES provider in, in Leicester, Leicestershire. But yet we are not commissioned by the NHS. We're not commissioned by our public health. And when we start to apply for funding, we've just recently applied for the mine funding, rejected. When we apply for other bodies, so so it's not just organisations. I'm not pleading for organisational like hours. What I'm pleading, what I'm saying is that what you highlighted is organisations are disappearing. The BAME sector in mental health is completely wiped out. The voluntary sector is completely wiped out, and some of us are struggling on reserves. So that's the first point. The second point is is there is clearly a lack of equity in terms of how NHS England are commissioning services around mental health. I say that because in our neighbouring city in Derby, we find in this COVID period that Relate as a national, a national body were commissioned to provide extra resources. We've had an increase of need for counselling, domestic abuse, welfare benefits through the COVID lockdown. And we've luckily we've had lit pockets of funding to do that, but the the actual need, the capacity we have, we don't because we don't have the funding to deliver it. So, um, so, and I think from Voices' point of view, I think I'm, I'm thank God I've, I've in, in, engaged recently with the Voices project because I've been I've been a a, cre a critique of Voices for many years, even when um, Jeremy was around, because I was saying that what we're still are not seeing is the diversity of voices engaged around the table to influence that change, and we have got these new reviews that have been carried out. We've got all these commissions being set, set up, but what are my concerns is, are they going to be having the diversity of voices or are we going to have the same voices who have repeatedly failed us? And I'm going to leave it there. Sorry to go on. No, thank you, Kiri. Um, and I'm also really pleased that you're engaging with, particularly with Rachel's project on for National Voices. Um, and may that not be the end. Yeah. Um, right, Rebecca, you are monitoring the chat. Is there stuff we might want to briefly mention here, lift out? Yeah, potentially. Um, Tina um, 
had some interesting things to say about the role of the third sector here um, and about whether or not the onus really is on the NHS services to be providing support in this mental health space. And, and if they don't, and we rely on the third sector, who will suffer and miss out? I'm just wondering, Tina, if you would like to elaborate on that. I think you work for CVS in Croydon. Do you want to take yourself off mute? Or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, Sorry, great. I couldn't find the mute button. <laughs> yes, I think I think whilst it's good that the third sector gets involved um, and gets gets funding to do all this all this stuff, it's good stuff and it's good to provide stuff locally. But in effect, it can create a, a postcode lottery because in areas where so, for example, it might be unpopular, but I'm going to choose the, the BAME areas. At the moment, there's a lot of funding poten potentially going to go towards those areas, given the, the stuff that's going on at the moment. And I, in, in Croydon, we've got some, some areas that are very disadvantaged, but don't have the BAME populations. And there's a potential there that they become even more disadvantaged because the funding will go move away from those areas because the funding will go towards the BAME popular population popula populated areas. So in effect, you're cre then creating a postcode lottery. And I'm sure there are postcode lotteries around the country already where there are areas where the third sector is very active and areas where the third sector isn't very active. So by the NHS pushing out towards uh, charities and becoming more reliant upon charities picking up work for mental health, I, I think this is a. I think this sort of thing does happen. I think it's there already, and I think I think the more the more we rely upon it, the bigger the postcode lottery becomes. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I don't think it's borne out in the evidence that um, BME communities or organisations have been sort of disproportionately benefiting, and it would no, really break a trend I'm if they were. It is an example, and it might be a yeah, bad example. Yeah, but I agree with you. Obviously, that when you rely on the VCSE to be kind of the safety net. It becomes very kind of patchy in places, and it yes, becomes yes. very. Um, it we lose the sort of minimum standards, and we lose the sort of uniformity of yes. of supervision. And I think it's something that we might want to sort of talk about, you know, during this discussion anyway. Sort of, you know, what what do we think? Where does the VCSE fit in into all of this? Um, so, you know, a lot of us I think pride ourselves, a lot of the National Voices members and other charities that they are kind of, that they're very good at providing well-being support and emotional support but Absolutely. what about people who need more um intensive mental health support and and how can we not end up just sort of plugging holes that are left behind when the when the when the state moves out you know how yeah. can we not I think, make I think a hole in the ruins of the of nhs provision yeah. i think you actually know, it's not up. it's not really a fault of the charities that provide the support i think actually the problem might be that as the services move out, there are too many holes to fill. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Tina. Um, Christina has raised her hand. Christina Sarau. Hello. Um, oh, it might have hit a little raw nerve there saying about um, the money going to blame communities. The money's going to health inequalities, and we need to recognise actually. Um, it so happens the BAME communities really have been left behind and not given you know this is my own opinion by the way I'll t you know um, yeah. that actually you know it, it we need to recognize actually it's not that a group of people are getting more now it's actually maybe the other group of people who feel like they're they're missing out are actually the ones who've been getting more the whole time so I think yeah no, um, I'm just suggesting that there might, there might be one or two other communities in a similar situation I'm not suggesting that you haven't that BAME haven't missed out any yeah, yeah, no, I, I, but but what I mean is, that I I think I think the people in this in this webinar possibly, or I, I know that myself, I have to be very careful in in kind of um, how that message is put across because actually other hmm. people take that message and it'll be taken very differently, and I think yeah. that's where we get bigger. Yes, divides. I understand that. Yeah, so we get. I'm trying to say it as carefully as I can. But oh, no, no, you know, I, 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 I respect live in a very disadvantaged yeah. area, so absolutely, rec you know, you know, yeah. I respect the fact that you said about, and and you know, you said it probably much better than me. I'm I'm quite blunt, so <laughs> that's but, okay. But it, it, you know, I do work for NHS England, um, 
and I am the lived experience ambassador. I've come in today because I've actually remembered today. So sorry, Charlotte, I've missed a few of these. So apologies, but I've been finding out um, afterwards. But this one I feel really strongly about. Um, is it? Uh, sorry, I don't want to get your name wrong. One second. Is it? Can you hear it? Um, did you say you're in Leicester? I'm in Leicester. Yeah, Christine. Christine. You're, in, you're in lockdown. We're in lockdown. Yes. Can, you, can I please have your email? I would like to share your email with somebody yeah. who uh, I was in a meeting yesterday and they were talking about, um, you know, having to look at ways of targeting communities that might be looking um, at TV. That's not, you know, you know, English TV. So therefore the message might be different. And I think that might be where some communities um, are getting a different message. So I know I'm Portuguese, so I know that um, I've got family that are you know, listening to Portuguese TV. And it's like, hello, let's watch English TV too, so that you know what's happening in, you know, in your local area as well. So I, you know, I'm fully aware that actually, uh, you know, we, we need to be, we need to be thinking that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a shielder. I kind of tick lots of boxes, me, um, but I'm a shielder, and I am petrified of what's going to happen. You know, this weekend's a big one, right? So, and I'm quite open I, about I my mental health. You know, I'm really. Serious. I'm really open about my mental health. You know, I am somebody by weekend free. I had a proper meltdown. I was really bad and I haven't been that bad in years. Um, I'm just very fortunate that the best thing that happened to me was I was working. So, um, you know, from home, but, you know, I was working, but actually having to kind of reach out and I'm still living my lived experience. And I think that's what sometimes people forget. And um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I've been telling people nonstop, reach out to anybody who's shielding because actually it's a scary thing and people that are shielding on their own. I felt lonely shielding and I had people in my home and that says a lot, right? Okay, thank you, Christina, and thank you for being open good. about this. All right, know. and I'll just move on to the next question, please. Um, so we are now after, and you know, that's really useful also for those of you who want to kind of just more engage on the chat. We found that really useful on previous webinars. So if you can be, you know, if you're aware of good work that's going on that addresses these inequalities we've just been talking about, be they, um, you know, about class and deprivation or about race inequalities or about any other inequalities um, that you're aware of. I remember we had a conversation with um, the LGBT Foundation, for example, a little while back that mental health, um, mental health is much more common amongst LGBTQ citizens and um, and how badly some of those people have experienced um, the lockdown, for example. So if you have got any ideas on um, a few, uh, you know, examples of where our sector or where the NHS have done good work or local authorities, social care, addressing these inequalities, it would be great. Um, whilst you do that thinking, I saw Sam's hand go up at one point. If you just want to say whatever you wanted to say now or is the moment past? Um, I mean, it, it was kind of just in relation to the, the last point, but just um, to say that, um, you know, the mental health has been a, a major issue for people with Parkinson's during the lockdown. Um, we've done some survey work between, um, I think it was over the course of May, um, that uh, showed that um, I think it's about 30% increase in anxiety um, and one we didn't expect was this. 10% increase in people experiencing hallucinations. Uh, it's one of the side effects of Parkinson's medication and I think um, perhaps we don't know quite know why but it's a lot of these are becoming more distressing. I think that's perhaps because of the anxiety as well as kind of turning what would be tolerable hallucinations into distressing ones um, and we've got um, the thing that I was surprised about was that um, because we had asked the parliamentary question to find out, um, you know, what what are the plans for uh, or government plans for people with Parkinson's to be able to access, continue accessing psychological services during the pandemic period. Um, and the response was very much kind of uh, there's digital options, there's telephone and face to face with PPE. Um, but we found that half of people who had mental health appointments were cancelled yeah. and of those um, almost kind of uh, around 80 percent um, were not offered a telephone or video as an alternative so um, we're mm -hmm. sort of quite keen to emphasize the need for mental health to be prioritized in the, as NHS services are resumed 
um, and also kind of you know support the call for a longer term um, sort of growth and investment in the mental health workforce to meet this you know growing demand. It was under resourced um, in terms of workforce before the crisis. It's you know the demand's just gone up and the capacity's dropped. So um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of highlight it's obviously something that we're particularly keen on seeing some action on. Thank you. And I think that's something that a lot of um, the charities we're working with are, are kind of working towards a call for, in a, re in a way, really foregrounding mental health support for the next period as we stand up services again, the way the NHS puts it, they say we have got to stand up services again. And I think what we're finding is that there's a real need to prioritise mental health services and that in their whole spectrum, be that peer support or emotional support, but also, um, you know, full blown um, psychiatric led or psychology led um, support. Um, I don't know whether, you know, someone here called Cherie said something about a crisis cafe as a good kind of option during this period. I'd be interested to know whether that continued face to face, because I'm sort of loosely involved with a crisis cafe close to where I live, which had to close down and, and they did do some remote support, but whether you manage, what, what, how did you mutate? How did you adapt to the situation, Tina? If you want to talk about that, that'd be great. Uh, whilst you think about that, Andy, are you aware of any good examples of um, stuff that's been done to address inequality in your work? Yeah, yeah. So the Mind uh, Crisis Cafe in Luton, um, they continued uh, over the phone. So it was available from 6 p.m. till 11 p.m. Um, and anybody could get in contact uh, over the phone. So that's how it was operating at the moment. And was that then the person calling, speaking to the person working at the crisis cafe, or did people talk to each other as well? Just speaking to the workers, okay. yeah. Okay, because the crisis cafe that I'm aware of is, is very much sort of about peer support. And okay. that's yeah. hard to create, I suppose, over the phone, isn't it? Yeah, we um, so I work for a women's charity, so we're trying to do uh, things over Zoom, just have like social coffee mornings so people can talk to each other how they normally would in the centre um, to try and create that as well. Yeah, brilliant. I'm seeing on the chat now suddenly, as always, loads of great examples. Um, letter writing, pen pal project. Um, and then also something around going for socially distant walks with bereaved people um i can totally relate to that that uh, that will be a, a, a helpful thing to do does anyone want to talk about any of these examples andy are you aware of anything um that that addresses inequalities andy bell from center for mental health it's it's interesting, isn't it? And and um, I mean, thank you for the examples that are coming in. And, and a lot of these we'd really like to follow up and know more about. We're we're currently running a commission for equality in mental health, which is gathering yeah. evidence, uh, both of of where the difficulties are, but also where there are really exciting, positive things happening. So so, please, if you can share any of this stuff with us, drop us a line. If you've got anything that's written down, or you you've done a video or whatever, then then please send it over. We really want to hear about this. We want to know what's working uh, as, as well as what, what some of the gaps are. And, and they're clearly very considerable at the moment. But um, so I someone think one already of the copied a link. So we will definitely um, pull all of that together. Just Marvelous. before we move on to the final question, has anyone got, does anyone from those people who've contributed some ideas of what's working want to speak? No, I Charlotte, don't want to. Charlotte, can I, I'll just say yes. something quickly. Um, I know with the with Mental Health Awareness Week, and then what we've realised is that we've had to do Zoom-based sessions. Again, it's not for all, accessible for all, but the ones that we found a new cohort of people that were suffering with anxiety and, and and through lockdown. So we did, you know, mindfulness. We did yoga. We did meditation, breathing, and that's enabled us to reach out to more people and more people finding out about us. But then we also help got. The, the younger generation to help their family members who don't have Zoom or didn't have the setup to set to help them set it up so they could engage with us. So that was useful. And Andy, I'll share that with you as well. 
We've got um, two hands up before we move on to the next question. Sophie and Liz. Sophie, do you want to go first? Mute button. Dear, yeah, sorry. There you are. Don't worry. <laughs> sorry, it's my first uh, first webinar, so that's my excuse. So I'm from Rainbow Trust and we have teams of family support workers that uh, provide emotional and practical support to families where a child is seriously ill. Um, so it's just to say, yeah, we've done, um, our workers just had to switch very quickly to doing that work virtually um, and through telephones. That's both with parents and also with um, the sick child or siblings. So for, you know, for young children, it would just depend on what's appropriate for them. Some of that is play sessions enacting things really creative work but for parents i think it was really about it's it still is about not being forgotten i think a lot of services as we've said have dropped away it's been really important for people to get a personal text a personal email um lots of services have just sent them round bobbins and i think people have really appreciated that family support workers actually are still there they're still in touch they can still talk to them um although we had to furlough some staff which doesn't help but um but yeah, the findings we've had are very much backed up by the Disabled Children's Partnership, the Family Fund, Contact, Together for Short Lives. There's plenty of evidence out there now, so it's really about trying to adjust now to the, the lifting in shielding advice and changes to the lockdown. So. Thank you, Sophie. It's really, I, I'm always so amazed how quickly our sector adapts. I think that's almost one of the kind of defining characteristics of the VCSE. And sometimes I think smaller charities do it more quickly. <laughs> I know we some of the large charities that took quite a while to get their call centre yeah. staff, into, you know, home working and all of that. Whereas I think small and medium sized charities are often like, right, OK, let's do it differently. There were right. one or two staff. There were some staff who didn't want to do it. And then after a week or so, they were convinced and they realised that this this might continue after things go back to normal. There might be some families in remote one parts of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liz, before we move on to the final question, you wanted to also say something. Uh, yeah, sorry, I tried to unmute before and I couldn't get there in time. Um, my name is Liz Madge. I work for Stockport Council uh, in Greater Manchester. And when lockdown was announced, um, the council worked with the VCSE sector to set up um, a forum where we would meet, lots of different organisations would meet on a twice weekly basis. Um, and some of the things that have come out of that, I think have been really positive. Um, things like I mentioned before about the Pen Pals project, so Free Stockport Advocacy, Age UK Stockport and Healthwatch Stockport all working together and volunteers writing letters um, and just some really good stuff where, I mean I've not really been involved in the mental health work previously but it does seem like there's a lot of good sort of working between organisations um, and some of the other things that people have mentioned so socially distant walk walks um people that have been shielding and have you know this is the first time maybe they've been they've been out in three months and people have lost confidence so going out with just one person um seems to be working and then yeah zoom calls um i think somebody else mentioned it that people maybe that wouldn't come along to a meeting mm. have felt it's okay to yeah be on a zoom call well, even I, that last time at our webinar about the digital divide that whilst it obviously doesn't work for everyone yeah and we need to be really mindful of that and we need to find solutions for those people and that's also coming up in the chat it seems yeah. to be a low threshold easy access way in for some other people who might not want to go to some strange village hall and sit with strangers but they yeah give it and a go yeah i mean a colleague mentioned that they um what they do is if they want to somebody wants to join they don't have to speak they can turn off their camera yeah. They can turn off Learn their microphone yeah. and they're just sort of listening in for the first yeah. week to see whether they want to be part of it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I always think that's such a heartening part of our conversations when people talk about the stuff that we're so great at inventing. Um, doesn't mean we can be complacent and particularly if we put the inequalities lens over it all, we can't assume we always reach the people with the biggest need. Um, so what more needs to be done very briefly, um, I'm mindful we need to cover a couple of other things on the agenda, but um, I, I would really quite like to know what your sense is, whether the support offers that we as the VCSE develop actually reach the people who are at the sharpest end of inequalities or 
do we not know or are we pretty confident they don't um and you know where how does that need to work the patchwork of community groups so that some organizations who are much closer to excluded communities maybe have better access just wonder whether any of those thoughts um, resonate with you or what else you think we need to argue for in terms of what the health system needs to do but also in terms of what our sector needs to um, get better at any thoughts on this whilst people are kind of figuring out what to say andy i was wondering whether you have any thoughts on what the vcse sector can do in order to step up and to reduce inequalities have you got any thoughts on that yeah I mean, and of course we're a voluntary sector organization too and and i think we're all of us hopefully thinking about that in a more focused way than, 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 than many were before um and and i think realistically this does come down to to actually having conversations with people who are on on the wrong end of inequalities and 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 who have experienced for many years uh, really quite serious levels of exclusion of discrimination of oppression let's call it what it is uh and and their voices haven't been heard and and i think it's one of the things in a sense we go around saying the voluntary community sector is really good at and maybe by comparison we are but we have to keep testing ourselves out on that and not believing the hype and 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 i think it, it's contingent on all of us to, to really just just engage and listen and and do that on terms that that people feel comfortable with rather than assuming because we're good organizations with a kind heart we do it right all the time yeah excellent digital exclusion has come up as one of the things we need to get better at um and I think there's some initiatives around kind of getting kit to people, but I think what people here are saying and what we heard on the digital exclusion webinar is it's not just the kit, it's it's support as well. Um, and, and having volunteers or others helping people get confident and um, using a tablet or opening an email or joining a chat group or whatever. Um, Neil. You uh, said, I think there's lots that our sector needs to improve on. Uh, you are at the British Red Cross. I know that you've kicked off some interesting work with your uh, staff network and so on. Do you want to say something? Yes, of course I can. Hi. Um, I mean, with obviously the incidents in the US and George Floyd's death, lots of organisations had you know, responded and I think for us, uh, the work on BAME uh, communities um, started earlier when we noticed the disproportionate effect of, on, of COVID on uh, different ethnic minority groups. And I think since then, we, I mean, internally, uh, our BAME network, um, we have been, you know, talking about this a lot and um, um, had various workshops actually with the whole organisation and it was really great to see Mike, our CEO, um, supporting this work and really uh, making it a priority for what we can do internally to improve uh, ways of working, to ensure that, you know, people from different um, ethnic minority backgrounds don't feel excluded or don't feel more welcome and supported during this difficult um, period. Um, and we are reviewing really all kinds of uh, things from how we'd reach in various areas, um, different groups um, and through to recruitment processes, through to. Um, yeah, I mean, even as I said, already from a kind of policy perspective, we are working, we have been working on this much earlier and uh, I think we are just strengthening our uh, messaging and our uh, evidence around that where we know we don't have currently the evidence because for us it um, wasn't a focus prior to yeah. COVID but I think yeah we are we have been really doing a lot of work and it is hard work because even yeah. our marketing you know our um, like it is it really touches on everything that we do at the moment and um, and our every uh, BAME uh, network member is part of all of those conversations and um, feeds them back actually to the network and again has a direct contact with our CEO as well and the leadership team to really um, change this uh, our ways of working and change the narrative and change um, yeah 
lots of things. But uh, yeah, there is a lot we can do. And I think particularly the funding point that Kirit mentioned earlier is something that I'm really, really concerned. And Kirit, I um, sent your email to some colleagues earlier when you raised that issue, because um, I know in Leicester we are also going to do some work. Um, I mean, we are probably present. So um, just making sure that we connect these dots really, really quickly. Thank you, Neil. Right, um, loads of engagement on the chat and we won't lose this and we will come back to it and we always write a summary and share that with everyone as well. And also, you know, where you and Andy are making contact and you're making contact with each other, it's all very heartwarming to see. But I don't want us to leave before uh, Kate had a chance to talk about a project that we are pursuing together with the Centre for Mental Health. Um, Kate, over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. So, uh, morning everyone. So, uh, my name's Kate and I'm an associate at National Voices. I just wanted to take five minutes or so just to describe a piece of work that we're currently doing, which I think is really relevant actually to a lot of the themes that we've talked about in the webinar today. Um, so National Voices is working in partnership with Centre for Mental Health to carry out a piece of insights work to explore the issue of integrating support for people's mental health with their physical health. Um, and the idea for this really came from our understanding, um, and as Andy mentioned earlier, that having a long term physical health problem often has emotional consequences for individuals. Um, but despite this, people with long term physical conditions report that the emotional distress they experience as a result of that condition is rarely acknowledged really or supported through the health and social care systems in the way that that individual would like. So the project is going to explore from the perspective of family members, people with lived experiences and health and social care professionals. I guess, firstly, you know, what are the emotional consequences of having a long term physical health condition or multiple conditions? Um, and for those individuals, what is it that helps or hinders disclosing their distress and receiving support? For those people as well, how does having a long term physical health condition interact with wider economic and social well-being and what impact does that have on the situation? And lastly, we want to explore with health and social care staff themselves how they cope with dealing with emotional distress in others. So what are the barriers to them providing effective support and what do they know about what works really, really well? in terms of helping individuals to feel supported with their mental health as well as their physical health conditions. Um, so the project was conceived pre-COVID and it was never intended to be a COVID project, but clearly we had to find a way to acknowledge the impact of the current situation, both on the individuals concerned and their emotions um, and on the system, the strain that it's going to create. So that is an element that we're going to be exploring um, as well. So we're currently at the stage of trying to rec recruit as many participants as possible to take part. Um, and we would like to do a series of interviews with people with lived experiences and family carers, health and social care professionals as well. And we also have a series of online surveys for people with lived experience, family carers and professionals. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be reviewing existing literature and insights. Um, it's really important for this project to be a success that we get perspectives from as wide a range of health conditions as we possibly can and speak to a kind of really diverse range of people as part of that insights work as well, just so that we're capturing a broad range of experiences and thinking about how the system needs to respond. Um, so I would say to all of you, really, if you know of anyone that would like to take part in this piece of work, um, be it people with lived experience or professionals that you know have particular interest, do get in touch with me or with Joe Wilton from the Centre for Mental Health. Um, I'm sure that our email addresses can be sent around to this group after this um, webinar. And just to say that we are particularly keen to hear from harder to reach groups and we are planning a quite a targeted approach to ensure that groups from different um, areas are heard. Um, but if you're an organisation that you work with specific groups, um, you'll be really key to helping us kind of achieve that. So do reach out and get in touch. Um, so the research is taking place over the summer 
and then we hope to publish a report with recommendations in the autumn of this year. So thank you for listening. If you're interested, do get in touch and I will hand back to Charlotte and the team. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. I've copied in Rebecca's email address. Rebecca leads for this work um, on the team. Kate is a consultant who sort of manages the project. So please get in touch with Rebecca if you think you can get the survey in front of people, particularly those people who are often excluded from such insight work. And also if you think you've got people who might want to be interviewed from similar backgrounds. Um, before we wrap up, and I'm mindful that we're out of time, uh, just to remind you that we're doing more webinars in two weeks time. We're doing one about community and COVID and where does this leave us and how can we avoid looking at the world with rose tinted glasses that everything is wonderful, but how can we also acknowledge that the community have really stepped up in many places and wonderful things have happened. And again, obviously looking at that through the inequalities lens. We still really want you and your people to tell us your experiences on our platform. Um, ourcoadadvisor.co.uk. At the moment, we're particularly working um, around the lifting of lockdown. But for example, Kirit, if you could motivate some of your um, partners and, and um, people you're working with to talk about their experiences in Leicester, it would be absolutely fascinating and it would be so useful for us to be able to take this to decision makers. We've taken the, um, the data that we've collected, the insight we've collected on this website already to the CQC, to Department of Health and Social Care, to the Shielding Programme, to the Health Select Committee. It's a really good way you can get your people's experiences in front of decision makers and that's really all we're trying to do. So stay engaged, come to our future webinars, um, contribute to our COVID Voices and if you aren't already members of National Voices, please do consider it during COVID. We've made it free for people to join if their organisation has a turnover of less than £100,000. But even if you are, you know, south of a million, it's very cheap um, to join. And if you're more than that, then you can afford it. <laughs> so um, please um, do join our membership. Um, we are only strong together. I'm really grateful to Andy. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. I'm really grateful for Kate for coming in and talking about this work. Um, do see us, do see you in two weeks' time. Stay engaged. We'll leave the chat on for a little longer for you to download any more thoughts and have a nice weekend when it comes. Bye bye.